health special and brain tumours. We know they're bad news. The brain is probably the most complex organ in the body. The fact that it is locked away inside the skull means any issue with it can be tough to deal with. According to NHS statistics, more than 9,000 people are diagnosed with a brain tumour every year. While they can be operated on and many go on to live happy, recovered lives, the prognosis is not so bright for everyone, to say the least. Today we'll be looking at what brain tumours are and what could be done about them and how you find out if you got one. With me in the studio is one of the foremost brain tumour experts in the UK, Professor Jeff Pilkington. Professor Pilkington is the director of the Brain Tumour Research Centre of Excellence. And joining us as well is our resident GP, Dr Sarah Jarvis, who often gets the first sight of a patient with this problem. Or maybe who fears they've got it, because of course it's to the point. two different things, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely, 9,000 people a year, that's one in kind of, you know, 10,000 people getting it. But... Uh, believe me, one in ten of my patients at some point has been convinced they've got a brain tumour. Mm. So, if you've got a question for us, 0500 288 291. Um, Professor Pilkington, welcome, first of all. Great to see you. you. And just tell us what the first symptom usually is. Well, people would uh, would expect that the first symptom would be a headache, but in fact the headache is the presenting uh, symptom in only about 40% of cases. So, because the brain is a very complex structure, there are many ways that the, the tumour will present. And that could be um, speech de uh, deficient, uh, speech de defects. It could be um, balance, ataxia. It could be a whole uh, number of different uh, different presentations. So it's it's not quite as simple as it sounds. You may not be able to answer this, but but by the time somebody goes to the doctor and says, "I can't move my right arm" or whatever the symptom is, how long has the brain tumor been growing inside them on well, average? A that, year? That's a, that's a very interesting question. I, th I think many of these tumors may very well be long standing, but of course we don't MRI scan patients or or the general public at, on a regular basis. So it's very difficult to know when they they arise. There is some evidence that uh, tumours can be there for, for many, many years, and indeed certain tumours, if you look at them under the microscope pathologically, there is there are signs that they've been there a long time because they, they show things like calcification, which is a sign that that tumour's been resident in the brain for many years without being clinically apparent. Oh, so you can have a tumour and not die from it? You can have you can have tumours for very very long periods of time before you're cognizant of that. And okay. we, we see even low grade, even what are called benign brain tumours, can grow to massive lesions before they present clinically. And I think that's a major problem. I always struggle with this word benign. Uh, the idea that any growth in the brain can be benign sounds crazy. But I guess if the alternative is cancerous, maybe maybe you would opt for benign if you had to. I, I think we have to define what what we mean by def by uh, malignant and benign. Benign actually is is a term which is based largely upon the the histological appearance so when you look Meaning, at tumors, that's, that's under a microscope if you yeah. look if you if you cut if you take some brain out at biopsy you cut it into slices stain it put it under the microscope and you look initially or what has been been done over many years is pattern recognition then you assign it to a category now brain tumors are are grade one and two which are deemed to be benign and three and four are deemed to be malignant however even a grade two tumor can undergo malignant change and become a malignant tumour in, in time. Also, the very fact that it's growing within a confined space within the, the cranium, the skull, other than other parts of the body, um, means that there will be signs of raised intracranial pressure and that in itself can be life-threatening. So right. benign is and a very course, obscure term. In it also context. depends slightly on where it is. So for instance, if it's Absolutely. in the bit of your brain, your brain stem, which affects your breathing, which affects your heart rate, it can mm. kill you. And if it's in a bit of the brain where it's wrapped itself around deep inside the tissue and you can't get to it with surgery, the most, quote, benign of brain tumours, and that's why I hate the term benign mm. brain tumours. Sounds crazy to have, say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. So we, we often hear the phrase, uh, he's got cancer, oh, someone says, what, what's going on? Well, it started in his liver, let's say, I'm afraid it's moved to his brain. Mm. And at that point, you know, maybe so, the game's up. But that's, in a way, not what we're talking about here, are we? We're talking about right. cancers that start in the brain. So that's what we call a secondary cancer. So in other words, a spread, a metastasis. And normally we diagnose cancers on the basis that one of the features they've got, apart from, as Jeff so rightly says, how they look under the microscope. I hate the idea that I've just said how, as he so rightly says, to somebody who's forgotten more about brain tumours <laughs> since he arrived in the studio than I've ever known. But... 
I hope you I hope you'll forgive me. But basically, when we think about things spreading, so the vast majority of cancers will spread to somewhere else. One of the few exceptions is something called a basal cell cancer, which is a kind of skin cancer, which is if you're going to have a, a cancer, that's the one to get because it will eat away locally, but it doesn't spread. But most will spread, and some have a particular tendency to spread to bone and brain. Right. We're thinking about things like breast cancer, lung cancer, sometimes kidney cancers. Mm. And are we still, Jeff, you're doing research on, you know, cures and treatment and all of that. Are we still going in with a knife into the brain, which sounds horrendously dangerous? Yes, I mean, neurosurgery is carried out with knives. It's carried out with other, other procedures as well. We have a, an interesting thing, thing called an eye knife now, which is able to not just excise the tumour and gradually etch away at the tumour, but also to look at the, the vapours which are coming off of this sort of brain, brain tissue being burnt, and you can then analyse that for the chemical constituents. So it's telling us more about the biology of the tumour as well as amazing. helping to remove That is amazing. So, I'm glad I asked that. I'm, yeah. I'm not a neurosurgeon, and uh, but I defer to my, my friends and colleagues in that area. So they're using it's lasers amazing. and eye knives and knives, and they, yeah. I guess they still blast it with radiotherapy and chemotherapy, do they? The, yes, indeed. The uh, the main for, for malignant primary brain tumors. That's tumors that start from the substance substance of the brain. Generally, they have resective surgery and then a mixture of radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy that, that is being used routinely has been around now for probably four decades. So we're, we're dealing with agents which are called DNA alkylating agents. But which they're always, essentially, always, I'm sorry to interrupt. I always wonder whether this is like the, the equivalent of laptop battery technology. It just hasn't kept up with everything else. Someone, a friend of mine whose wife was having chemo said, this looks medieval now. Yeah, one of the problems I think we've got with cancer is there's been a huge amount of advance in terms of cancer treatments. It's extraordinary in terms of breast cancer. 40 years ago, 75% of women expected to be dead within five years. Now, 75% of women are alive. One of the big problems I think we've got with brain tumours partly is that there aren't enough of them to do the research um, and partly I think that you know maybe because there are relatively few of them relatively rare cancers it's very difficult as a pharmaceutical company if it's going to cost you a billion pounds to bring a drug to market it is very difficult to justify developing a, 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 um, a drug which can only be used for a tiny proportion of those 9,000 people. Okay well, this is brilliant thank you so much both of you do stay with us talking about brain tumours got some calls and we'll Play Ed Sheeran first. On Radio 2, uh, that's his new song, how about that? 20 past one, and we are talking about brain tumours here. We've got Professor Jeff Pilkington with us and Dr Sarah Jarvis. Louise Collins is in Reading, and Louise, you suffered yourself, is that right? Hi, Jeremy, yes, that's right. I was diagnosed when I, I think I was about 28 when I found out. And it was a, well, now, do we say cancerous or benign? How would you like to define it? Well, I, the only thing I've ever been told was that it was very, very low grade, so it was almost non-cancerous, but not quite, if that makes sense. OK. <laughs> Go on, Sarah. Yeah. I think low grade's a really good way of putting it, because exactly as our specialist has just pointed out, things which may technically once have been described as being benign can behave in a malignant way. So yeah. I much prefer to talk about low grade tumours. And when I talk about brain cancer, I tend to be talking about cancer that's spread from somewhere else. Now, the good news is very, very low grade means the chance of it doing anything nasty um, is very low and therefore the chances are that if you can get rid of it all you will probably not find it coming back. Louise, you had two though, did you? Well, I have two now. I seem to be collecting them up. <laughs> but my second one is um, an entirely different tumour. It's a meningioma which is in the, the, the lining of, of the brain. Okay, well, look, you're, you're on the line to the foremost brain tumour expert, so you can ask Jeff anything you want. Hi, um, I've been explained that um, possibly the meningioma may be as a result of the what they call the field radiation. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm likely to have some gamma rays to stop, because that is growing. It's growing fairly slowly, but... Um, I'm worried that the radiotherapy that I will have, or the gamma that I'll have, will affect my old original tumour. Hmm, OK, so... I mean, it, since it's been seems... treated, it's really been behaving itself. OK, <laughs> yeah. all right, let's, let's find out. Because there, there seem to be two points there. When, when you were originally diagnosed with a brain tumour when you in your younger uh, years, w where was it positioned? What, what part of the brain was affected? Was it in the back of the on brain? My, the... On the stem, on the brain stem, and in the fourth ventricle. 
Okay, and the you, you don't know what that one was called? There, there was a, was yes, a name Yeah, an appendomoma. Okay, fine. Um, and did you receive radiation therapy at that stage? Yes, I had um, I had surgery to remove as much as they could do, and uh, I had six weeks of radiotherapy. My consultant since then has said that, um, as Sarah was saying, things have progressed so much that were they to have gone in now, they would have actually been removed 100% of it because things have changed right. that much. Right. They would have so taken they, it out. That, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I had right. the, uh, what, what they couldn't remove at the time was treated with radiotherapy. So I suppose the, the issue here, Jeff, mm. is is whether the second cancer might have been started by the treatment for I the first. It's it's possible with radiation therapy you can get second tumours um, pr being produced later on, much much later on. Um, so that that is a, is a possibility. Um, the other thing is there whether these two tumours are related. There are certain genes that that can be linked there um, or whether this meningioma just come about spontaneously uh, and that they can be age related as well so there are a number of possibilities there louise thank you for your call good luck with your treatment as well margaret stewart is in seton sluice in northumberland hi margaret hi and your husband's first symptom was what um he had a visual disturbance mm -hmm. so if you would look at an image he would turn to look somewhere else. He would still see the previous image flashing. Um, he had that. That was the only symptom he ever had. Um, the doctors eventually thought he'd had a mini stroke. Um, so that's what he was diagnosed with. And then eventually, at the end of July, um, he was diagnosed with the glioblastoma, which, as you know, is a grade, they're all grade fours. Um, and as I say, that that was the only symptom he had. He didn't have a seizure. He was not unwell. Headaches? No. Um, no headaches. Absolutely nothing. So it was Jeff. It was a, a vision change. I, I mean, that's that's one of the the spectrum of of changes you can see in patients with these grade four tumours. She's absolutely right. Glioblastoma is a grade four tumour. It invades into the brain, um, and it can present in in different ways according to the location within the brain. And, and Margaret, what's the what's the outlook? Um, he well, he was given twelve to fifteen months initially. Um, mm. He had a full resection. Well, all they could see the removed radio chemo, then more chemo. Um, he's doing okay. He's actually just had an MRI, which was quite pleasing. Um, basically still managing to do more or less what we did before. Um, so he's outlived his prognosis. He's very positive. Um, Cause one so of the things open, you what, know, he's going to be one of the few that does survive. One of the things to bear in mind, Margaret, is that when we give, you know, one of the reasons doctors are so unkeen to say, how long have I got, doctor, is because it can be so variable. And the more high grade a brain tumour is, the more likely you are if, even if you think you've cut the whole thing out, to have to give radiotherapy yeah. and chemotherapy to get rid of any microscopic deposits because particularly glioblastomas tend to be very aggressive, they tend to invade, and even if you think you've got rid of it all, the little microscopic deposits all around. But the good news is some people respond much, much better, and that's why mm. averages are averages. If a drug trial says, on average, life is extended by three months. That might mean that half the people didn't get any benefit at all, and half of them got fantastic benefit. Mm. Jeff, so, so the, the mean survival time uh, is 14.5 months, but that is, that is across the entire spectrum, and this is age-related. So the older you are, generally, the, the, the less well you'll do. The younger you, you are, the better you'll do. But there are a lot of other factors as well. So there's been a, a recent World Health Organization reclassification of tumours of the brain central nervous system and some of the if you look evaluate the tumours not just by what they look like under a microscope but by the molecular pattern that's created for each of those tumours there are some of the grade three tumours which will do worse than the grade fours and some of the grade fours do worse than the grade threes based on the expression of a particular gene called idh1 now so you, you there's a there's a massive information out there which has to be gathered together which will be a component of the the answer to how long you're going to but survive may, with any maybe maybe margaret your husband doesn't want doesn't want a date it sounds like he's being very positive is he <laughs> uh, he didn't he didn't want the date it was just given to us at the, the consultation that was they didn't say do you want to know they just said and when you are given a date that's what you tend to think about but yeah 
He is, he is he's positive. He, he's not. He said he's going absolutely nowhere. So. That's, not <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> thanks, Margaret. Yeah. Bless. Good, good luck to him and good luck to you. Oh, I think, thank you. Bye. Go, yeah, go on, Sarah. Really interesting to re be reminded by Margaret that, of course, people are very, very different. And when we oh. talk these days, we've come such a long way in terms of cancer treatment, talking to people. But it's really important to find out what they want. I've had patients in the past. I had one patient who had cancer and she didn't want to talk about it. And we compromised that we would, it was her thingy. Hmm. And we would talk about her thingy, and we found a way of, of discussing it. But it's long gone, thank goodness, are the days when the consultant would march in at the head of his little band of white-coated ducklings and talk across the patient and explain to the, to the other doc doctors present and all his acolytes that this was a patient who really shouldn't buy any long-term records. You know, I mean, it really was we've almost moved, that We've bad. moved on from that, Jeff, haven't we? we? Have. Well, patients also give their tumours names. They're, they're, they're yeah. sort of their, their pets and things. Mm. Deb's emails and says, Can the doctor tell me if brain tumours are hereditary? Both my grandmother and my mum have passed away from brain tumours. Both had lung cancer and were recovered and then developed the brain tumour as secondary. OK. There, there, there are some tumours which affect the brain which are part of what are called familial cancer syndromes. And there are a number of these. One of them is called Lee frau mini syndrome. And this is, this is uh, a defect in a gene called the P53 gene. Those are incredibly rare. Um, so, yes, some tumours are familial, but also you see uh, people who are in the same family but are actually married to each other. So that has to be an environmental issue rather than something which is passed in the germline. And in Debs's case, she's got a mother and a grandmother. I'd be so, quite surprised if they didn't both smoke, sadly. And, of course, that's a much, much more likely Good course. point, good point. Robert Anderson in Kettering, Northamptonshire, says, my eldest daughter is 37. She was diagnosed with a brain tumour two years ago. She'd had headaches and she said she didn't have any energy. I had to press the GP to send her on for a referral. Nobody seemed to believe that she could have one. Initially, we were told it wasn't cancerous, but when it was taken out, they said, yes, it is actually aggressive, and they said she had about 18 months. She is still going, but her last scan has shown that the tumour has spread. The whole area needs much more funding. Mm. You can really... agree with that. Well, I'm, I'm quite lucky. We're, my labs are funded by a, a charity which is simply called Brain Tumour Research. Um, and we're one of four centres now, two in London, one in Plymouth, one in Portsmouth, where I am. Um, which receives funding. And this is trying to build a critical mass of researchers and su get sustainability in young people coming into the field to work in this area. But historically, it has been underfunded. We recently had a, a, a petition which was signed by 121,000 people, which led to a debate in the, in the House of Commons. And so the issue is now... now being brought to the forefront. But yes, it, the tumours of the brain are under research, they are underfunded, and we need more people to uh, to sign up to this very complex And meanwhile, as the GP, Sarah, you're just hoping you don't miss the one patient. You are, and of course, Robert's highlighted that maybe it is only 40% of people who present with headache, but the problem is that almost all my patients come in with headache at some point and most of them think they've got a brain tumour so probably just worth bearing in mind there are certain things that we would describe as red flags so a, a headache that actively wakes you up from your sleep a headache which is bad when you're lying flat and gets better when you stand up. A headache that's brought on by rather than made worse by coughing or straining what we call the Valsalva manoeuvre. Obviously if you get a headache and you then develop seizures at the same time. And something called pulsatile tinnitus. So tinnitus which is the ringing in the ear but which is a sort of whooshing, a regular rhythmic whooshing that can be related. So those are the sort of headaches we're talking about. The sort of headaches which form a band around your forehead and they're a bit miserable but you can get on with your day they're much better if you lie down in a quiet room you don't feel sick with them you don't have any flashing lights you don't have any problems any other nerve symptoms any weakness down one side and they go away with painkillers those are very very rarely anything to worry about. thank you very much really really interesting dr sarah jarvis with professor jeff pilkington discussing brain tumors